download our IELTS preparation app and access unlimited premium practice material for your exam. Part 1. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello, Robert Gladwell speaking. Oh, hi. My name's Chloe Martin. Yes, I am. Well, I've just moved to the area. Yes, I can give you some information, as the club started in 1957. We now have about 60 members. Our youngest member is 10, and our oldest member is 78. Oh, I think I saw a picture in the newspaper the other day of some of your members being presented with a prize. Yes, the youth section did very well in a competition and won £100, which will help with their next production. Uh, anyway, uh, tell me a bit more about yourself. Well, I've done a bit of acting. I was in a couple of musicals when I was at university and a historical play more recently. Hmm. We mainly do comedy plays. We get good audiences for that kind of thing. We haven't attempted a musical yet, but we might do one soon. Oh. Uh, when do you usually meet? On Tuesdays. Well, presumably I'll need to do an audition. Yes. There were a few auditions last Tuesday, and we'll be doing more at our next meeting, which is in two weeks' time. That's on Tuesday the 12th of March. There'll be another opportunity two weeks after that, which will be on the 26th of March. Oh, well, I can come to your next meeting, and if I don't get an acting part in a play, I'd be happy to help with something else. I've designed publicity before. Great. We're very short of people who can do that. So that would be really good. There are a lot of people who like making scenery, so we get plenty of help with that, but we haven't got enough people to do the lights at the moment. So, if you think you can do that, or you have any friends who would like to, uh, do bring them along. We can show you what to do if you haven't got any experience. Mm, I'll have to think about it. So, do you meet in the theatre? We do our performances in the Manor Theatre, but we only hire that for the nights of the actual performances. We meet to rehearse every Tuesday evening in the Community Hall. We rent a room there. Oh, I'm not sure where that is. I'll be coming by car because I don't live in the town centre. It's in Ashburton Road. As you're coming towards the centre, down Regent Street, you need to turn left at the crossroads. Oh, I know. There's a big car park down there, just before you get to a hotel. It's on the other side of the road from the sports centre. That's it. That's the closest place to leave your car, and you don't have to pay in the evening to park there. We meet at 7.30, and we usually finish by 9.30 or 10. OK. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. I haven't mentioned that we have to make a charge. Everyone pays a subscription of £180 to be a member for a year. You can pay for the whole year at once, or you can pay £15 every month. It works out the same. There are reductions for retired people and under-18s, but I don't think you come into either category. 
No, I'm 26. Oh, <laughs> that fee covers all the costs, like photocopying of scripts and producing the posters, but it excludes the costumes for the performances. We ask people to pay for the hire of those themselves. It does mean they look after them properly, as they know they won't get their deposit back otherwise. Mm. Can I come along to the next meeting, then? Of course. We'd love to see you. And if you want to know more about how we run the auditions or the next play we're doing, why don't you give our secretary a ring? She'll be really pleased to help you. Oh, what's her name? It's Sarah Sordicott. That's S-A-W-D-I-C-O-T. Oh, got that. And her phone number? I've only got a mobile number for her. Um, just a minute. Uh, let me find it. Ah, yeah, it's um, o seven nine double five two four double o six three. Great. Thanks for your help. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a man called Christian Jackson, staff coordinator of a trade fair facility, showing a new employee a map of the facility. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Welcome everyone to this year's Sales Motivation Conference. I can already see a lot of faces that I recognize from previous conferences. So welcome back. And to all the new delegates, welcome. We hope that you gain a lot over the next four days. Boost your confidence and get lots of energy to go back to your jobs refreshed and ready to sell. We have 12 motivational speakers here for the conference all ready to give you their ideas and tips for how to improve your sales performance. The keynote speaker is world-famous motivational star Melissa Foreman. She's going to open the conference today directly after I speak to you, and then she will have four two-hour sessions, one this afternoon and the other three on the mornings that follow at 11 a.m. Her presentation is called Bounce Back, and it is an entertaining talk about how to take the knockbacks and refusals, how to turn them around, and how to succeed in the long run. When you attend Melissa's talk, you will also have the opportunity to buy a signed copy of her latest book, with the same title as her presentation, at a discounted rate. Melissa is giving the same talk four times. So we ask that you only attend her talk once so others are able to get to see it. I know that many of you have decided to attend this conference just to hear Melissa speak. But make sure you make the most of the other great motivators on our roster who all have incredibly inspiring offerings. There are four lecture halls here at this venue and there will be three sessions per day. Two each morning and one in the afternoon from 9 to 11 from 11:30 until 1:30 and then from 3 until 5 p.m. each speaker will be giving their presentation four times so over the next four days if you attend 
three sessions a day, you should be able to attend one presentation from every motivator. You might not all be able to achieve this because not only do we have talks from speakers, but quite a few interactive workshops where you will be able to work on your selling skills together. As you know, the theme of this conference is making the buy. With this, we mean putting the focus on the buyer. Often, sales methods are based on making the sale and using high pressure techniques. This hard sell strategy is stressful for both the salesperson and the buyer. We want to help you find ways of making the buyer come to you after your initial pitch, making them feel more in control of a purchasing situation, and ultimately more willing to buy product from you. Whether you are selling insurance, cars, clothing or electronics this conference will teach you skills that you can take away and put into practice if your sales have been in a lull we are hoping that the next few days will get you feeling positive and proactive again we want to send you back out into the world completely prepared to work as the top salespeople in your fields before you hear the rest of the conversation you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now, for the business end of things, I think most of you have already been through the registration process. If not, we ask that you get that out of the way before you attend any sessions and the conference fee should be paid in full. If you have driven here today and just registered, use the free parking card you received when you registered to leave the car park this evening. If you try to leave without being able to show your card, you will be charged for parking so make sure you keep it with you. We ask that you wear your ID cards at all times when in the building. I probably don't need to tell you that this is a non-smoking venue, which includes outside in front of the building. Lunch will be available in the banquet hall every day from 1.30 until 3, where there will be a buffet that also has vegetarian and vegan options. There are six seating areas with tea and coffee facilities scattered all over the venue. There are also plenty of power stations to charge your phones and laptops. We ask that all telephones be turned off during sessions and any recording of sessions is not permitted. If anyone has any questions, the registration desk will be staffed for the entirety of the conference and they will help you with anything you need. So again, Welcome to our motivational conference, and we hope the next few days will get you all fired up to and ready to succeed in a very competitive and fast-paced work environment. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You hear two students, Anne and Fergus, planning a project that they need to submit to their university tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26.
I'm glad I'm doing this project with you, Fergus. I think we will work very well together. How do you think we should go about it? I really like the idea of a project on how potato crisps are made. I did find the whole production process a bit complicated in the lecture, though. It may only take about fifteen minutes to get from potato to crisp in a sealed bag, but there are a lot of steps in that process. I think it would be clearer to us if we draw up a flowchart. Then we can see what pieces of machinery are needed for each point in the process. Good idea. I remember that the potatoes they use have to be less than twenty-four hours out of the ground, so they need to be transported by truck to the factory very quickly. Then, once they come off the truck, they are put straight into the crisp making machine, and that's a continuously moving conveyor system that passes the potatoes through numerous barrels, tubs, funnels, and fryers. I just can't remember the order. Well, it's quite amazing. All completely automated. After the potatoes are loaded onto the conveyor belt, they pass through rolling barrels that brush the dirt off them. Then they travel along a water canal to the peeler. The peeler takes the skin off, right? Yes. The potatoes tumble around abrasive rollers until the skin is removed. My notes say the peeler can skin twelve thousand pounds of potatoes an hour. Then they move on to another conveyor that separates the potatoes into sizes. The smaller ones drop through gaps in the conveyor, and the larger ones are chopped into smaller pieces that then fall into the rinser, joining the smaller potatoes. They are now all about the same size. Then, from what I remember in the lecture, they go along the rinser conveyor where they are sprayed with water before they get into the slicer. This is where they are cut into the crisp shapes. Here they are spun in a huge drum with adjustable blades. From just one potato, they get enough crisps for a small packet. And then they are rinsed in cold water for about a minute before they pass along another conveyor belt, which dries off the excess water with an air blower. Okay, that's all a bit clearer now. So then they enter and move through the long fryer, which contains canola oil boiling at 190 degrees Celsius. They exit the fryer, still on a metal conveyor belt, and the excess oil drips through perforations in the belt. After that, they pass through an electronic scanner, which identifies any brown spots or defects and blows individual chips off the conveyor belt with air pressure. It's amazing. Yes, that electronic scanner is genius. No more burnt crisps in the packet. Then they get a shower of salt and are sprayed with flavorings before dropping through a funnel. The funnel weighs out portions to be packaged. These portions then drop into bags that get heat sealed, and there you have a packet of crisps. Before you hear the rest of the conversation. You have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Okay, that flowchart has made everything a lot clearer. Now our project is to come up with some way to reduce the amount of water consumption in the process. How are we going to go about this? We definitely need to visit a factory ourselves and talk to the people who run the machines. I want to find out why the slices need to be in cold water for one minute. This might be a part of the process that we could reduce. Perhaps the conveyor belt could be shorter here if we can say get the time down to thirty seconds and save that amount of water, or we could recycle the water from that process, which is relatively clean, for the first rinsing step before the potatoes are peeled. What do you think? It's only the stage where the last of the dirt is being taken off. 
That's brilliant. Now the assignment doesn't have to be on the part of the process that involves frying and packaging. It is the preparation section that we need to focus on. Once we decide on the modifications to be done to the machine, we have to present them in design form. You are much better at that than me. I can write most of the text to go with it. That's fine with me, as long as the ideas come from both of us. Fergus, can you also arrange the factory visit? Then we can go together. I can't wait to see the machines in action. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a part of a lecture about fillings in teeth. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Today, we are going to look at how tooth decay is managed through the repair of dental caries by inserting cavity fillings into teeth. Statistically speaking, quite a few of you in this lecture theater would have fillings in your teeth, but being on the receiving end of a filling does not necessarily mean you know what is being done in your mouth. Tooth decay destroys the surface layer or the enamel of a tooth. This usually occurs in the natural crevices of the occlusal surfaces or the areas where the teeth touch, in the back molars of the teeth. The decay is caused by a buildup of bacterial matter called plaque, which breaks down the enamel surface. There are varying degrees of this decay. It may just affect a very superficial part of the enamel layer of the tooth, in which case the affected enamel can be simply ground down to reveal undamaged enamel. If the decay passes through the hard enamel layer and into the softer layer under it, called dentine, a cavity filling will need to be done. Should the cavity go as far as reaching the delicate, living pulp of the tooth, at the center of the dentine layer, a more aggressive type of procedure called a root canal filling is required, which involves destroying the pulp and the nerve endings and blood vessels it contains and completely filling the large cavity that is left. Another option is to remove the tooth entirely and replace it with a dental implant a metal post which is surgically embedded into the jawbone so that the prosthetic replacement tooth can be attached to it. Let's look at the most common procedure, which is a cavity filling for a tooth where the dentine layer has been compromised. The dentist cleans away the remaining decay in the tooth with a drill after the patient has received a numbing local anesthetic. This removal of decayed enamel and dentine prevents further damage, but the tooth now needs to be repaired with a filling to make it sound again. Cavity filling material was traditionally a silver metal amalgam, but now most dentists have started using composite resin to fill teeth, as it has the advantage of being able to be color matched to that of the enamel, while amalgam fillings are the color of metal. In the past, amalgam fillings were the more durable option, but now configurations of composite resin have been developed, which are nearly as durable. 
a composite resin filling, is injected into the prepared cavity in a paste form with a pump syringe that allows the dentist to fill the cavity in layers of the resin. Each layer is hardened separately by curing it with ultraviolet light in a process called photopolymerization. This means the paste can mold exactly to the shape of the cavity. After the final layer, the dentist then shapes the surface to match the natural occlusal surface of the tooth. Amalgam is used to fill the teeth in a similar way. Silver amalgam is a combination of silver, tin, and mercury and is mixed in a machine in the surgery before being inserted. Remember, the composite resin arrives already mixed in a pump syringe. With an amalgam filling, the dentist needs to remove more of the tooth to create retention grooves. This means carving certain angles and bevels into the teeth so that the filling locks into the structure of the tooth, a bit like a jigsaw. In this way, it is less likely to fall out. This is not necessary with composite resin, as it uses a chemical bonding process, rather than relying on more mechanical retention. The amalgam is packed tightly into the cavity and then molded and carved to fit the shape of the tooth surface. It takes about 24 hours to harden completely, so the patient needs to avoid chewing in that time. The important thing for both processes is that all the decaying tooth matter is completely removed before the tooth is filled, or the decay may return under the filling and might result in the loss of the tooth. The choice of whether to have composite resin or amalgam fillings can be decided upon the balance of a number of factors. Composite resin fillings are more aesthetically pleasing, as they are the same color as the teeth, and their insertion means that less tooth matter needs to be removed. So the teeth are less compromised in terms of strength and durability. Also, composite resin does not contain mercury, which is of concern to many patients. Amalgam fillings, however, are less expensive and more durable. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.